Hello, I'm Alec Avdikov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. So, remember all the way back in the summer when I said that the podcaster Zach Twomley of When Diplomacy Fails had given my podcast a mention on Twitter? Yeah, well, for today's episode, I got a chance to speak with him about Frederick the Great's invasion of Silesia. I cannot believe how fortunate I am that I was able to have this conversation. Zach is truly a class act and is in full support of independent podcasters. Once again, this podcast has given me opportunities way beyond my expectations. He is one of my favorite podcasters, and I got the chance to speak with him. The podcast, When Diplomacy Fails, is in the description below. Please, please, please give his show a listen because he has put a ton of work into his podcast. His vast library of over 600 episodes and 10 years of podcasting speaks for himself. Zach is incredibly intelligent, and I am forever grateful for this opportunity. So yeah, in this episode, we, you are going to hear a wide variety of topics because I am a notorious scatterbrain. We talked about the Holy Roman Empire, the role of the Habsburgs, including the infamous Bowl of Mushrooms, and Frederick's mad scheme of taking an incredibly rich province off of one of the most powerful empires in Europe. In conclusion, I just want to say three things. Thanks to Zach for this cool chance to have a talk with him. Thank you for the people who have just started listening to my podcast. And thank you to all of you out there who have listened to this throughout the whole time, especially to the people I am close to. Unlike what I said in the first episode, my mom actually listens to my podcast. But anyway, here's a nice little recap episode with a focus on Frederick's Invasion. All right. So uh, how, are, how are things going, Zach? Things are going great, Alec. Thank you so much for having me on or me having you on or wh wh whatever you whatever way you put it, because we're both appearing on each other's feeds. So this is going to be yeah, great. Um, so today we are going to talk about the invasion of Silesia in December 1740 by Frederick the Great. Before he was great, he was just Frederick and... I suppose had a lot of ambitions and was a bit obsessed with glory. How how much does your uh, does your audience know about the uh, structure of the Holy Roman Empire? Oh, what a question! Well, I'll save you Voltaire's famous quote of not being holy an empire or really Roman at all. I suppose I just kind of brought it in there anyway. But we have gone through it a good bit with the Thirty Years' War, so we have the kind of broad spectrum. But obviously, by seventeen forty, things had. Things had changed a little bit. There were more electors floating around, and you could argue between Saxony going for the Polish crown and Prussia trying to be a kingdom all of its own, and then you have Hanover as well also being ruled by the British. It's kind of, it's almost like everyone's trying to take a piece of, of the pie or make their own way in the world while still being in the Holy Roman Empire. So it's a very interesting time of change. I actually like to make the analogy by that point. Essentially, they're all independent states united in very huge air quotes around one emperor. Mm. I, I like to make the analogy that uh, essentially all the United States, if they're all independent and the president was just the figurehead and sometimes the states would follow the lead of the president and other times they don't, uh, hmm. such as the one time where in the Holy Roman Empire, Bavaria chose to side with France against the Holy Roman Empire in the War of Spanish Succession. Absolutely, yeah. And the interesting thing about that was that it seems as though the Allies didn't quite expect that to happen. In the initial years of the War of the Spanish Succession, Bavaria was a real pain for the Allied war plans, and it kind of soaked up a lot of attention and basically helped the French kind of reinforce their, their border areas, really. Yeah, that's very true. I'd like to think that uh, the Holy Roman Empire was just, it, it was more so a, just a confederation of states. So you, you can make somewhat of an argument that it's, it's similar to how the EU is today, but uh, I'm sure you know much more about that than, than I do, considering you. Un unfortunately, 
<laughs> your country is in the European Union, and I'm just mm -hmm. the the bystander watching the the dominoes fall. So. <laughs> well, let's hope no more dominoes fall. The whole Brexit situation is bad enough. Oh and uh, yeah, I mean, European unity is something I do believe quite strongly. And I think the uh, the argument for it is, is definitely strong, especially when you look at what's happening with Russia invading Ukraine and all that jazz. Oh, yeah. But yeah. certainly the, the parallels are very interesting. So you'd have the EU Commission president would probably be the closest thing to the Holy Roman Emperor, but of course there is a, a lot, kind of a, a lot of independent uh, initiatives and independent policy going on outside of what the EU is kind of dictating. I mean, a great example of that is France and Emmanuel Macron, the French president, basically finding a way for France in in the world while using the EU as a kind of pedestal. So, I wonder if you could argue that some Holy Roman Empire states, while benefiting from the security and ties of the Holy Roman Empire were also trying to kind of make their own way in the world. I mean, Bavaria is a, a good example of that. Bavaria and definitely Saxony as well. Yeah, because Saxony. With, with the War of Polish Succession, there was Stanislaus Leszczynski, who is a member of the Polish uh, nobility, uh, going against a Saxon. Both of those people were supported by different sides of Europe. Mm -hmm. And with, with France, with Stanislaus Leszczynski and the Saxon claimant by Austria and Russia and, and Prussia as well. Saxony could have been our Prussia. Yeah. Because if you think about it, say Saxony was the one who invades Silesia. Now you have Saxony connected with Poland mm -hmm. and they have this huge, massive super state where... Prussia is completely blocked out. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. actually one of the reasons why Frederick the Great invaded Silesia. Silesia is this uh, province that used to be a part of uh, Bohemia, and Bohemia now in the Czech Republic, and Silesia will now be a part in what is today Poland. This area is extremely important to the Habsburg Empire. It has a bunch of linen industry. It was a quarter of Austria's tax revenue. And by the time Prussia overtook Silesia, it increased its population by 50%. So this is an extremely important province. Not only was uh, Frederick looking at the economic perspective, but it was he was looking at possible uh, rivals uh, in the Holy Roman Empire. So it wasn't just about it wasn't just about great power politics. It was middling power politics as well, because at this point, Prussia was not quite large enough to be a great power, but it wasn't small enough so that it was just the, the middling power in Europe. So, yeah, I would I, I would say that because Frederick the Great did invade Silesia, just transformed so many things, not only culturally, politically, economically. I would say that overall, my podcast is the uh, context you could use for behind why the French Revolution occurred. Yeah, and absolutely how the German states, basically, the, the question of German dualism, as they called, will Germany go towards Berlin or will it go towards Vienna? That question really starts to appear during this period. And, and you're right, the having looked at this period from the kind of Polish perspective for my Poland is not yet lost series. It's really fascinating to ask what might have been because these Saxon Kings really had a chance to kind of change the course of German history and make the question more about, should it be Dresden or Vienna rather than Berlin? It was strange though, because I think Frederick might've been expecting a bit too much. He might have overestimated his Saxon neighbor because especially after the War of the Polish Succession, it didn't seem like Augustus III, the elector of Saxony and new king of Poland, it didn't seem like he was all that determined to do anything now that he'd gotten his Polish crown. And he seemed very happy to kind of just exist and use Polish resources and everything for the purposes of prestige, but not really increase his power all that much. And one thing that he was quite clear on was how much he owed his position to Russia. So in that sense, 
I think while on the map of Europe, uh, inter, a, a, a continuously connected landmass and, and, and statelet of Saxony and then Silesia and then Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth would have been extremely impressive. I'm not sure if Augustus III was really the right man to leverage those things because he didn't really didn't really seem like he was all that interested in leveraging anything except the resources of his country to give himself a, a nice, comfortable, quiet life. Oh, I mean, you could make that argument for almost all of the European states uh, by the time that Frederick the Great uh, came to power as king. In 1740, you had Louis the Fifteenth, who, as a ruler, is not very impressive at all. You had uh, King George the Second, who was just a puppet behind the Parliament of Great Britain, and you had Charles the Sixth who was one of the most, uh, I would say, lethargic because <laughs> his court, I think on average, was about 70 years old as far as the, the average age of the court. And this was at a time when the life expectancy, I, I know for Britain, was uh, 39 years old. And you have a Yeesh. whole bunch of 70-year-old men just talking about each other about oh what's the new wig of this season supposed to be like <laughs> whereas whereas prussia prussia has the tradition that the sovereign is the first servant of the state this goes all mm -hmm. the way back to the great elector uh who is extremely underrated in prussian history and what he was able to do to make what was then brandenburg into a power that wasn't constantly stepped on it is it's honestly fascinating but sadly i don't have the time to go into that because frederick the great is very much more famous yeah that's very true it, it is interesting though in in that sense the great electors kind of period of rule and frederick the great's period of rule almost exactly mirror each other by about 100 years the great elector was from 1640 to I think 86, whereas, and you'll be able to correct me on this, Frederick the Great was 1740 to either 1780 or or the late 80s. I'm not exactly sure which, but it, it is remarkable that they're so close like that. 40 to 1786 and that for Frederick the Great, and then the Great Elector was till uh, 1640 to 1688. Cause I, I oh, there we that. go. Yeah. Because I do remember that uh, Frederick the Great ruled eight, uh, 46 years, which is yeah. honestly, for, for that time, for the amount of battles that he was in, it, it's it's like the old uh, the Bible quote, who lives by the sword dies by the sword. It's surprising that he did not die by the sword. If, <laughs> if you consider how many battles he was in, how many horses were shot under him, my goodness. Mm. Uh, uh, going back to uh, Charles the Sixth, we have to go and understand the uh, pr pragmatic sanction. Sure. Because this this is one of the reasons why Frederick the Great had the casus belli or the uh, the the cause for war in the first place, because the House of Habsburg was able to conquer a whole bunch of Europe to oversimplify things completely by marriage. They are able to bring up their status and wealth and power by marriage. And by the time they were the top of the European hierarchy, they decided, you know what? We don't want anybody else to do the same thing we did, so we're just going <laughs> to intermarry between ourselves. <laughs> it's, it's actually, I don't know if you're keeping up with the latest uh, series, but House of the Dragon very much kind of it's very reminiscent of that because you have a powerful house in in that case, the Targaryen dynasty, who are, again, very inbred. And they have been at the top of the food chain for quite a while, in that case, in Westeros. And there is also a succession crisis where the daughter of the ruling king is declared as the heir and it's never been done before and it's hugely controversial. And the only difference really is that in House of the Dragon, there's kind of stronger claimants that are that are male to the throne, whereas in 
our real life, which seems strange that this actually, this stuff all, all actually happened, but in our real life, there aren't that many strong claimants other than, you know, I married her sister and that's how I'm going to claim, you know, it's, it's, it is interesting though to see those things. I wonder where George R. R. Martin got his inspiration from. He doesn't have to look all that far into, into history. Oh, no, not at all. Um, but you, you sufficed it quite well as far as talking about uh, the House of Dragon. It, it almost parallels perfectly to, to our timeline and actual history. In, in the Pragmatic Sanction, it was the idea that uh, Charles VI of Austria's daughter or any children that he would uh, be able to have would be able to inherit the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. There, there were other claimants, such as Bavaria. Bavaria's Charles Albert believed that he could take over the Holy Roman Empire, and he actually would, in our timeline, create that only time where the Habsburgs were not the uh, emperors from the 1400s all the way until the end in 1806. So yeah. Bavaria was able to create the, the claim that Charles Albert deserved to be the Holy Roman Empire Emperor. Yeah, and interestingly, it's the Wittelsbach dynasty again. I believe it was 1400 to 1410 that they'd held the crown before. And basically from 1438, the Habsburgs had it in their back pocket and wouldn't let it go. So it kind of it does paint a picture of how dicey the Habsburg position was, that this legacy had been taken from them for the first time in 300 years austria had shown that it was very weak mm -hmm. um, so prince eugene of savoy a very huge and important figure uh, figure in um, austrian history was able to help the austrian military show that it had power until he slowly got older and through that time he actually had dementia and when somebody bases when a state bases a military or a state function on the individual, it will go wrong mm -hmm. because characteristics of that individual will slowly decline as they age and eventually die off. Sure. You, you, you would see the same thing after Frederick the Great died. Uh, state institutions that were united around Frederick the Great and his work ethic and his logistical nitpicking it would eventually decay and so in 1806 by the time in, in napoleon invaded prussia mm -hmm. it was a shell of the prussian army was a shell of its former self yeah and that's only 20 years after he died like it's crazy charles the sixth was 55 years old and he was going into his reign just believing that okay we just lost to the Turks. I don't think things can get much worse from here. So I'm going to go on a hunting trip just to clear things up in my mind. So he goes on this hunting trip in Hungary. This is the most incredible story that I've gotten from the 1700s. During a dinner, he had this bowl of mushrooms. <laughs> and because of this bowl of mushrooms, history will change forever because he had food poisoning. He would eventually die later that month, and his daughter, Maria Theresa, would become the heiress of the Austrian Habsburg royal family. Charles VI believed that there was no way that Maria Theresa was actually going to rule. He, he expected that his husband would, uh, her husband would rule through proxy, and so he never spent the time to educate Maria Theresa in uh, ways to rule. So you have a very young, very inexperienced Maria Theresa on the throne of the Habsburg Empire, while everybody else, everybody in Central Europe was just looking at the Habsburgs with drool on their lips, thinking, <laughs> okay, what territory can we get from this lady? And um, the first one to strike, obviously, was Frederick the Great. He wrote to his chief minister, when one is a favorable situation, should one make use of it or not? If the Habsburgs are in such a weak position 
and its allies, Britain and Russia, are off distracted on their own. And there's nothing else that could stop me. Why don't I take that opportunity? It's very famous example, Maria Theresa coming to the throne and people perceiving her as weak. But it's by no means the only time that this happened. I mean, you mentioned the Great Northern War a few times, but one of the main reasons that that war came into being was because the, well, in this case, Augustus II of Saxony, Poland, you had uh, the Russian Tsar, and then you also had the Danes all tried to attack Sweden because Charles the Twelfth was 17 or 18 years old, and they perceived him as a, a young, weak, inexperienced king. So this tendency of, of equating the power of the state with the inexperience or experience of, of the new monarch is a, quite a surprisingly common trend and has led to war in the past. So, I mean, in the end of the Northern War, I suppose you could argue Sweden's enemies were victorious. So maybe from that, even though it took 21 years, maybe from that they took, they took heart and thought that, hey, maybe we can make lightning strike twice. So we've talked a good bit about 1740 itself and the kind of context of the period. Maybe run us through what you think would be going through Maria Theresa's mind when having been assured by Frederick himself, no less, that they were going to uphold pragmatic sanction, that in fact a Prussian army is invading one of your richest provinces and intends to take it away. Silesia itself was guarded by a very small Austrian army. I'm pretty sure it was around 2,000 infantry, 1,000 cavalry, and a total of 3,000 men. Maria Theresa was like, well, we're screwed. And, <laughs> the, and, the, and the, uh, the Austrian court was like, okay, we, we can just uh, give up Silesia. And Maria Theresa said no. Almost all of her court said that there's, there's no way that we could defeat this strong army, especially with how our resources are spread completely thin. Uh, the Habsburg monarchy was, uh, had just lost the war with the Turks and did not have very many reliable troops to count upon. Mm. But Maria Theresa was able to go to Hungary and ask for the Hungarians to mobilize different, uh, I think, around... She asked for 40,000 troops, and she only received about 20,000. However, she was able to piece through a bunch of uh, different soldiers throughout her uh, empire and bring an army of around 40,000 into what is uh, now the Czech Republic, into what was then Bohemia. And uh, in the winter of 1740, uh, Frederick was able to... Uh, go and take over Silesia in a very quick lightning strike. Was only able to was able to occupy almost the entire territory in about a month, when armies were moving much slower than Frederick the Great's army at that time. Yeah. Um, one thing that one aspect that is often overlooked is logistics, just in history in general. Oh yeah, because definitely. All of Frederick the Great's advisors were really against the invasion in general was because he was going to invade Silesia in the winter. Yeah, the December, winter. It goes against all of the uh, ideas of war at, time, at the time that we should not go to war in the winter. We should just focus on our ability to, to just make it through, and then we can, f we can work on the military in the, in the spring. But Frederick said, when will we have this possibility ever again? He, he said specifically in a quote, if one does not advance, one retreats. And so he took that principle and he put it on Silesia. And with that, he was able to invade and conquer Silesia in, in, a, in about a month. So, yeah, it, it wasn't just politically unexpected for the Austrians. They, they, they might have had some kind of idea he was planning something, but having assured them that he would abide by the terms at, at the very least they might have thought i mean it's the winter so even if he does attack us it's not going to be now it'll be in the spring or in the summer during the campaigning season so either way we have a bit of a breather to have our army repaired and kind of plan for the next few months but then 
bam, <laughs> like yeah. out of nowhere, not just against all the political agreements, but all the kind of the expectations and norms of, of the day. We, we would have thought it would be a complete logistical nightmare to try and invade anywhere in Europe. I mean, that part of, of Europe during the winter, like you can expect to find a good deal of snow, as of course they did. Oh, yeah. Now, if, if you want to even take this a step further uh, and look around the entire huge scope of climate back in the day, this was during the Little Ice Age as well. So with global warming happening today, we don't necessarily know the full feel of the full scale of the winter at that time. So even though we do have poor winters now as far as uh, snow and things go like that, it was worse back in those days. Yeah. It was, it was a lot worse. Frederick had to face the elements and he also had to move his father's shiny army down south and make this daring attack. Uh, probably on the understanding that once he invaded, he wouldn't have to fight an actual pivotal battle for a few months. So in that sense, it might have been like more recommended, not just the element of surprise, but also tactically he could take this province that isn't very well defended and he wouldn't actually have to face an Austrian army until the Austrians pick their jaws off the floor and uh, find some kind of way to send an army north. So in that sense, it, it does seem like a good tactical decision, but I'm sure Maria Theresa was very depressed when she found out. Oh, not just depressed. She was mad with the fury of vengeance. <laughs> I think I think that it, it, it goes back to the idea that Frederick actually didn't think he was going to fight at all. He just thought he was going to strong arm the Austrians into saying, um, oh, yeah, we surrender. Uh, here's Silesia for you. Uh, you can take the keys whenever you want. Uh, it, it's yours. He, he went back to Berlin after the uh, December campaign and let the, his uh, generals on the ground deal with the different forts and strong points that were left. So he fully expected that the diplomatic work to begin at that point, and Silesia would just be something that he could have now. Obviously, that did not occur because Maria Theresa has revenge in her eyes. And uh, it, it goes all the way to through the First Silesian War. Maria Theresa eventually creates a peace with Frederick because she was being invaded by the French and Bavarians and the Saxons all at once. There were multiple battles that were key to Frederick staying in Silesia. And the, the first battle that Frederick fights is the Battle of Molwitz. This was during the, the May of 1741. The Austrian uh, Field Marshal, Field Marshal Neiberg, was in Bohemia bringing troops and eventually in counter-invaded Silesia to take back the uh, former Austrian province. Now, in, in Molwitz, when the two armies finally met up, Frederick did not have his best general with him. Sh sure, he had uh, a Field Marshal Schwerin, but he left the, the famous Prince Leopold of Anhalt Deshau behind him, uh, the, named the Old Deshauer. Frederick the Great believed that he didn't want to have tutors with him. He wanted to prove his own mettle. Huh. Uh, didn't exactly, didn't exactly go. I mean, to spoil, I mean, your listeners obviously know what happens next, but for the sake of my own, I mean, in, in terms of your first ever battle, it didn't exactly go how Frederick was expecting. Oh my goodness, no. The, the Prussian army deployed very slowly, very, very much so by the books. They, they created their battle line in, in the snow, and they marched forward slowly, and then they just stood there. But the Austrians, their, their cavalry, one of the best cavalries in Europe, mind you, they decided, all right, the Prussians are about to attack us, let's attack them first. Uh, the Austrian cavalry charged and charged and charged, and the Prussians did nothing. The Prussian cavalry did nothing. Uh, Frederick actually had to flee the battle because it looked like he was going to lose. 
and he did not want to be captured and become this uh, puppet king where uh, he was in Austrian captivity. During this time, it was clear to uh, Field Marshal Schwerin that all he needed to do was just reform the infantry, bring back confidence to the men, and go on a big sweeping counter-offensive against the Austrian lines. And that's exactly what happened. So Frederick the Great won his first battle without actually being there. Yeah, it's an interesting asterisk next to his first victory that it wasn't even from like his own prowess. It was more from his subordinates. I often find with these great men in history, I mean, they're famous and deservedly so, but like with Louis XIV, they're very fortunate to have some very capable people around them. And Frederick was certainly no exception to that. He had fantastic generals, like you said. And if the soldiers had lost heart by seeing their king fleeing the field, I mean, it could have could have all been lost had like stability and morale not been restored. But I suppose that's the kind of consequences of so many years of good quality drilling and good education in, in tactics and in forbearance that his infantry basically won the day, whereas it looked for a time like the Austrian cavalry might win the day. Prussian mu- musketry was very important. I, I do have a, a, an episode about that, uh, well, two, two episodes about the, the Prussian infantry. If one soldier turns and flees, that might cause other soldiers in that very platoon to leave as well and flee because yeah uh, with linear warfare you have very bunched up lines in order to create a mass fire but you also have the trouble is if discipline breaks in any single way you're looking on a route and oftentimes after the battle when the cavalry was prowling against the enemy that that's when the most uh, deaths and casualties occurred. Absolutely, yeah. The the real strength of these units and the regiments that are standing there static, we imagine them stoically watching their friends fall. They knew in, in their hearts that if they shattered and, and fled, they were as good as dead. The strength of those units are in their cohesion and their discipline. And that's something that I really kind of learned from the 1600s and really the 1500s as well. Those periods of so-called military revolutions, it became less about the skill of the individual soldier and more about the fighting prowess of the unit itself. And if nothing else, the firepower of one musketeer is much less than the coordinated firepower drills of several men lined up in rows so that that explains we might look at at those formations and wonder why they were kind of lined up like that or how they could see their friends get killed in such large numbers and and of course people did rout but there was this understanding having drilled together that the real strength of the unit was in its ability to stick together i had a professor who was very who is a German culture professor who is uh, very interested in a uh, time period that we're talking about. And he said that Frederick the Great treated his army like a machine. He had uh, replaceable bits and pieces throughout the army that if one bit of the army was taken away or destroyed, it could be replaced. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a it's not a very kind of romantic way of looking at things, but we kind of we might put a kind of uh, a mask of of glory on these events, on on these battles and stuff. But the the reality is, this conflict happened because of the will, pretty much of one man. And while his soldiers might have had an attachment to him later on in his reign, it really was all about him and. The army was an instrument for him. It wasn't a group of people that he cared deeply about because, of course, if he did, they wouldn't be anywhere near this place risking their lives for his glory. Ironically, the weird thing is that he somewhat seemed to care about the individual soldiers and that if his soldiers were fit and the best in the world, then he would have the best army in the world. But he slightly cared about them individually. And that he was able to give really good eulogies later on in his life. 
he mm-hmm. was able to remember names, remember uh, the faces of the people individually, ironically give good speeches about them after they had passed away. But it took very many Prussian lives and deaths in order for him to be able to uh, seek his glory, as it were. Yeah, it's the the old adage of how how many lives is one man's glory worth? It's it kind of all comes back to that. But I mean, obviously, there was nothing exceptional about this way of looking at things. There's no real use in casting Frederick as some kind of heartless fiend who was unusual for his time. He was really just continuing on this trend of seeking glory for glory's sake, and of course, also strategic and financial reasons as well, bolstering the realm of Prussia, which would in turn bolster his own honor and prestige. The search for glory. That was the one thing he was looking for. Yeah. He was uh, he was a neoclassicist, so he had read books from Sophocles to, uh, to Plutarch to all these different classical writers, and he firmly believed that he was reliving the glory days of Rome. He, when he invaded Silesia, he uh, alluded to that by saying, I have crossed the Rubicon with flags flying and drums beating. Hmm. Yeah, the the long, long shadow of Rome over this period of time is really quite fascinating. I mean, I know you get some people these days who are pretty obsessed with Rome, understandably, but it is incredible to think that 1700 years after Rome, well, I suppose 13 or 4, 1400 after Rome, it actually fell, but the level of influence that was carried down to that point is is really incredible. Like just for those that might not be aware, the actual process of standing still with your lines of infantry and firing and then wheeling to the back of the line in a process called a counter march while the other people in your line fire, that was based on Roman tactics as well. That was built from the Dutch basically researching and looking through old ancient records for inspiration and getting this idea that if they could stand there like Roman soldiers did with their throwing throwing their javelins and then wheeling to the back of the line, if they could do that with muskets, then they would be able to redefine warfare. And it was bloody and it was difficult. And the first time that was actually done was in the year 1600. And during a battle there between the Spanish and, and the Dutch the whole practice was arguably kind of born, and then it grew from there through military drill manuals to the point where we have in the 1740s. But really, the debt that these people owed to Rome is really incredible. Oh, I 100% agree. And uh, the the death the debt that I owe to the history of Rome podcast is also important too. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Uh, without uh, Mike Duncan's History of Rome, I don't think uh, many of us would be uh, uh, podcasting right now. So. No, certainly not. No, uh, his contributions are are certainly uh, are certainly up there. You really can't deny them. I think History of England too, just because for me as a as a non American person, hearing an American voice, I mean, it's something that I'm kind of not not necessarily familiar with, but I'm like, oh yeah, it's an American podcast, or he's American making a podcast, but. When I heard an English guy, uh, as an Irish person, I was like, oh, well, if the freaking English can do it, then why can't I do it? So uh, that, that, that drove me on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I bet, yeah. So Frederick the Great was able to defeat the Austrians in uh, two battles, uh, Molwitz and Chotuzitz. And uh, at Chotuzitz, the, the Austrians could have been defeated more according to Frederick the Great, but he chose not to pursue that victory to its entirety because he could uh, show Maria Theresa that he was a man that she could work with. Right. And by that time, that point in time, uh, Vienna had almost been taken multiple times, uh, either by Frederick or by the, the French and Bavarian army that we haven't actually talked about. But France and Bavaria and Saxony all went to war against Austria with Prussia in 1742. Now, after Austria lost to the Prussians, they are in such a weakened state that it was time for Austria to make peace with Prussia. And so that's what happened. 
in uh, June of 1742. And that is where I shall leave you at. <laughs> well, there is certainly a lot of juicy diplomacy to come. So so if, if you wish to see what this action would have looked like, you will have to tune in to Alex's podcast, The History of Frederick the Great or Frederick the Great's Life and Times. Yeah, so um, you can you can find my podcast on uh, Apple, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or anywhere you can find a podcast platform. And I'm sure I'm sure there will be a link in your uh, show notes of of my uh, podcast. So. Well, there you have it, a nice little recap episode for understanding why these events took place. I again cannot thank Zach enough for that great time. It was a lovely conversation with an incredibly intelligent man. Please take the time to listen to Zach's podcast. He's definitely put in his work. Zach, I had a wonderful time with you, and I thought it was very fun and informative. Thank you all for listening to our talk. Also, all the important links are below, such as my email, Patreon, and social media. One last thing before we go. I recently received an email from a Nigel Betts. He thanked me for a great podcast. I really appreciated hearing from you and I hope to hear more from you all. To conclude today's podcast, I believe I shall say to you, until we meet again.